So good evening. My name is Ryan Wagner, and I'm the Wilderness Program Director here at Camp Manitwish. And tonight we're going to cover intermediate and voyager level trips and look at information regarding those. Uh, so you're able to make an informed decision on whether or not the Outpost Program is the program for you and your family uh, and your participants or not. Um, I look to uh, clarify any assumptions that you may have coming into these trips. I also look to just relay general information about these trips because um, some people like to hear it rather than read, read it and search through our website for that. And also set some expectations of what an outpost trip is compared to a summer camp trip. Um, so that's primarily the intent of these webinars. Um, we're going to cover, like I said, expectations. We'll do a trip overview of all the trips. Um, there's eight or six of them, so I'll try to be as quick as possible, but give you enough information and, and show you some pictures so that you can make that informed decision. Um, a general schedule of what an outpost trip looks like. It won't have specific dates, but it will have a general uh, frame of what participants do when they get here, um, what they do, uh, or how they get to, to get to their destinations, um, and then when they get back, what they what happens in camp. I'll look at staff training and our staff and some certifications that they all have. So the expectations for these trips. Um, these aren't summer camp trips, so the expectation is that these participants that, are, that come here for the Outpost program want to do a wilderness trip for an extended period of time. A nine-day trip and a 14-day trip are uh, nothing to joke about. They're, they're pretty serious trips, and they are in remote settings. Um, as young as our partic participants are at this level, um, it's still uh, a trip that can, you, you need to have some sort of wilderness tripping background in order to do it. That isn't necessarily the case at the Voyager level trips, but you have to be comfortable being away from home, um, being in a remote setting with a small group for an extended period of time. <clears throat> These trips are solo led, so that's one leader and four to five participants. Every once in a while we have six participants um, to that one leader. So it's a very good ratio, uh, but being solo led requires that our participants um, take as much um, much of a role in the trip as um, our leader in some instances, and, and that includes handing off the responsibility, <clears throat> excuse me, handing off the responsibility of navigation, of cooking food, of campsite setup, um, of daily chores uh, in and out of the campsite. So um, that's the expectation that, that we require our participants to know before they come in here. And they should uh, be up for, up for a nine or 14 day trip in a remote setting. Um, and they will be challenged to um, work on their character and leadership development while they're out there. So that is a, a high expectation of them. Um, as far as uh, our trips go, let's begin. So these are intermediate level trips. Our third, uh, the first three are intermediate level. Our Georgian Bay sea kayaking. We'll go over to the Georgian Bay, which is on the northern eastern side of Lake Huron. So this is in Canada. We need a passport. And uh, this trip will paddle uh, amongst uh, a lot of rock islands. This picture actually shows a lot of trees. Uh, it's not the case for the most of their trip, um, where the trip is traveling in and amongst rock islands such as this. Uh, there's not much to stake down the tents besides rocks and, and some string. That, that ties the corners down, uh, but it makes for a unique landscape. Um, typically, the weather is pretty good. The waters are warm, um, but you do have some big waves that, that can occur there with the right wind. We had some windier, rainier days this past summer, but the summer before was hot and dry and uh, not very much for wind as well. Uh, you'll travel, travel each day. You'll probably take one day off where you stay in the same location. Uh, you you won't have a resupply, and uh, you'll travel for those 14 days. Um, you get to and from camp with a camp vehicle, so we rent um, charter buses, or we rent 14-passenger vans or big buses, and we take our participants out there. It's about a 12-hour drive, so it's a long it's a long trip to and from Georgian Bay, but uh, once you're there, it is 
remarkably beautiful. Our pioneer trip is for canoeing, and that goes to the Quetico of um, Ontario, so just across the border from the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. You'll travel for 14 days there. You'll actually start on this side of the border in the Boundary Waters at a campsite, and the following morning you'll rise um, very early and start paddling, and you have to paddle across the border and stop in a remote ranger station there forget the lady's name but she's there every year and uh, she gives us our permits and they'll paddle and portage throughout the boundary or throughout the Quetico for 14 days. Now this trip is um, now however there's white water here and this trip is not a, a white water trip they won't run any white water but they do encounter it um, and they will have plenty of portaging to do um, such as the case in the boundary waters that I'll talk about in a little bit. Beautiful sunsets. Uh, you're starting to get on the um, southern side of some boreal type forests, um, so lower trees than we have here in the north woods uh, because there's not as long of a growing season, but very remote, and you'll be challenged to see people after you get into the inter interior of the Quetico. It's pretty remote in there. Um, great wildlife, moose, uh, bear, and great fishing as well. Al Royale is our intermediate backpacking trip that is on Al Royale in Lake Superior, a uh, big island uh, just south of Grand Marais, I guess, uh, the, way, the way the crow flies. And you'll essentially circumnavigate the island where you're backpacking each and every day. And you'll stay sometimes in shelters such as this because they're, they want to minimize the impact of all the campers that go there. It is a small island, but you'll cover approximately 200 miles, almost 200 miles circumnavigating the island, um, all on trail, but it is pretty rugged, and uh, you'll have to ensure that you show up um, ready to hike. You have worn in boots and um, physically fit to be able to um, complete the task of uh, circling the island. You will have one resupply on this trip. The other two intermediates won't. Um, you'll get resupplied in Windigo, uh, which is the southwestern part of the island, and you'll be dropped off at the northeastern side of the island. Um, so you'll circle all the way around getting resupplied in Windigo. Great views of both the land and the water. Um, in the interior, there's some huge lakes on the interior of the island, and uh, on the Exterior is Lake Superior, so you're able to hike along Lake Superior for some of the trip. It's a pretty amazing island to go to. Our Voyager level trip will uh, kayaking will go to the Apostles. Now I know some of you that came from summer camp. This is our only repeat trip. So if you did a far north sea kayaking trip, uh, the Voyager level um, sea kayaking is in the same exact place. So I don't recommend doing that unless you really loved it and you really want to go back. Um, so the uh, Apostle Islands are on the northern side, uh, northern shore of uh, Wisconsin on Lake Superior, and it is a national lake shore. And I believe there's 21 islands, I could be wrong. But you'll paddle in, um, between each of the islands. Some days you'll stay on the same island, we call those duck days. And there's plenty of sea caves and uh, rock structures such as this, high cliffs. You'll probably see deer. You probably will see black bear this year. Sand Island was actually closed to camping for a little while because of black bear. It was all over WPR um, if you listen to that. And unfortunately, that was the same rock just zoomed in. Sorry about that. But there's lighthouses along the way. This is Raspberry Island Lighthouse. Croquet is uh, a fun game that they like to stop in and play. And I think they can even do tours of the lighthouse if they like. There's lighthouses on many of the islands. This is Raspberry. There's also a Devil's Island lighthouse that um, we love to go to. You, you paddle up to the southern portion of Devil's Island, which is the way outer island on the northwest shore, or northwest part of the um, Apostles. And you can hike the length of the island, which is about a mile and a half long. And when you get to the northern shore, it's very boreal type forest because of it's, it's really cold and windy, um, 
with the wind coming off of Lake Superior. So from the southern part to the northern part, there's a change in the uh, tree and forest makeup. It's actually really unique. The Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness is our Voyager uh, canoeing trip. And just like the Quetico, this is up in uh, northern Minnesota, and the Quetico is on the other side of Canada. And very similar, except the Boundary Waters will have smaller lakes than the Quetico, um, pretty rugged portages, and quite a few portages in between each lake. Um, remote trip, you will most likely see people at the very beginning and the very end, but in the middle, we get into pretty remote areas where uh, you might not see people for about four days of your trip out of the nine days. Um, similar to our summer camp uh, trips, you'll paddle and portage up to probably 10, 15 miles each day, um, depending on your route, and eat and camp along the way. You'll, you'll stay in designated campsites, but those will be paddle up and see if the site's available. If not, keep paddling. Um, you'll have good luck in the middle of the trip finding campsites near the end of the trip, especially if it's a weekend, you might have a little bit of difficulty. You can see that we take different boats on those trips as well than we do in summer camp. So we have Rylex boats, a little bit lighter, easier to portage, and uh, and they paddle a little bit faster too. And our Voyager, last Voyager trip is our Superior Hiking Trail backpacking, which goes to the Superior Hiking Trail on the north shore of Lake Superior in Minnesota. So it's uh, Ottawa National Forest, just like the Boundary Waters, and Superior National Forest, I apologize. Superior National Forest, similar to the Boundary Waters. And you'll um, hike along the Superior Hiking Trail and you'll probably see people there, and there's some huts to stay in, but there's a lot of campsites along the way. And it's very similar to the Porcupine Mountains in that um, a lot of elevation gain up and down, especially for how old our participants are on this trip. And uh, want to make sure that they're physically fit and ready to do that. Um, but you do get some great views uh, of Lake Superior, and you get some great views of the Iron Range um, that you're basically hiking. A lot of waterfalls coming out of uh, that iron range and down into Lake Superior. Um, makes for great fishing um, some of the time and also makes for great swimming in some of those big pools below the waterfall. So what does an outpost trip look like when the participants get here? Uh, they'll arrive and we'll go to the Manitowoc Leadership Center instead of the summer camp cabins. Uh, the Voyageers, as of right now, they still stay in the Voyageer tents, which are out near the challenge course in their big canvas tents um, because they're only in camp for three days. And our leadership cabins are typically filled with uh, leadership groups. So uh, space is limited there. So they are out in the Voyageer tents. Um, they don't seem to mind, and they're only there for sleeping, essentially, because the days are filled with other activities. Um, the intermediates, however, are in the leadership cabins, um, so that's where they'll be staying when they're in camp. Um, as far as the schedule goes, the participants will arrive on day one. They'll do a health center check-in, and they'll do swim challenge, backpacking, kayaking, or canoeing. It doesn't matter. They'll do swim challenge, everybody, um, just like a day one for uh, summer camp. And most all the voyageurs will arrive at camp on the same day as summer camp open so they can share the bus on the way up and things like that. So that's the first day and, and that evening they'll go through and they'll talk to their group, they'll set expectations with each other and do their full value contracts, um, their, their kind of agreement to respect each other's space and use appropriate language, things like that. The following day is a group development day. The, so we'll do a lot of group Problem solving initiatives. They may get on the low challenge course, uh, low challenge roped course, and do some work together to build their team to understand each other's um, ways of thinking and ways of acting and where each other are going to fit in the group. This is a very important step because this will allow the leaders to know um, kind of those strengths and weaknesses from day one because as a solo leader, they need to know what they can and can't do with their participants and where kind of those, those boundaries lie. If they are uh, pushing their kids too much, what does the breaking point look like? 
Um, what does that storming phase look like where the participants are kind of arguing? So they need to figure that out in camp rather than in a remote setting. So those are, that's kind of what that first day looks like. That second day um, and third day are food pack out and gear pack out. They'll also do a expeditionary behavior talk where they um, talk about the first aid kit. They talk about um, cell phones or satellite phones that they take out on trail, what those emergency contacts are. They'll go over their routes. Um, They'll go over what to do in emergencies, and then um, they talk about expeditionary behavior and what um, what a solo-led trip in the outpost um, looks like when they're in a remote setting. Um, and that is something that's key because our leaders can't do it all, and that's different than summer camp. Um, or summer camp, we're really relying on our leaders pretty much to do everything. We try to hand over that leadership, but in outposts, we rely heavily on our outpost participants to be able to take the reins and uh, really step up and start um, being responsible for uh, for a lot of what happens in camp. Uh, I jumped ahead there, but um, once those first three days are over, they jump in the bus um, and they head to their their destinations. Um, the Isle Royale, I did not cover this. Isle Royale, we contract a bus to take them up to of the harbor and they jump on a ferry the following day and go to Isle Royale and start hiking. And then when they come back across on the ferry, uh, the, the charter bus brings them back. Everybody else, we drive to their location with our rented buses that, and we have our own drivers for that. So um, that's kind of the transportation to and from. It's usually, it is one day. So it's one day out to the pile and one day back one day out to the Boundary Waters or to the Apostles or to Georgian Bay and one day back. Georgian Bay is about a day and a half. What does staff training look like for the outpost? Um, it's an 11-day staff training. Summer camp is a nine-day. Um, there's one more day of a training trip in there. Our backpackers will go to the Porcupine Mountains, our canoeists will go to the Boundary Waters, and our kayakers will go to the Apostle Islands. Um, in the outpost program, we focus on a lot of the same things that the in-camp focuses on. We just have a little bit more time. So we do a ton of group dynamic work. Uh, what does a group look like? How do you make sure that the group is working properly together? Um, in a remote set setting for a very long time, with very little time in camp, you need to be able to make sure that these leaders know how to solve problems in the field and address issues um, such as conflicts that, that can arise. So. We work a lot on that with our leaders. We also work to um, uh, to make sure that they're trained up in in their first aid and emergency response. Uh, we make sure that they're technically competent to do the trips that they're doing, whether it's backpacking, canoeing, or kayaking. Um, and we make sure that they're able uh, to turn over leadership and um, to the participants. So, what does that look like? That's it. This just doesn't come natural. We have to intentionally focus on that transfer of leadership to the participants. So we work on that as well. And the, the character development and what does that look like and how does that transfer both to the field and then from the field back to home. And we focus on that quite a bit. All of our leaders have uh, wilderness first responder, they have CPR, and they have wilderness water safety. Many of our leaders have led for us for years. Um, we do take new leaders to Manitowish at these levels um, and we make sure it's an, it's an intense hiring process to get them in here. They have to have some have to have had some sort of wilderness tripping experience with kids before I will hire them uh, to lead trips with um, participants. Uh, 11 days is a long time of training but not quite long enough to make sure that they can lead a trip. So uh, I make sure when I'm hiring them that they've, they've led trips and we do Three reference checks on those as well. And our leaders are <laughs> mentally and physically capable. This is Mr. Sam Linder, I believe, on Isle Royale. Um, I choose leaders based upon judgment, um, proven leadership, and um, outside experiences. So when I'm talking to leaders, I ask them very pointedly, what are you doing in your off-season, if you will? with yourself. Are 
our leaders should be making themselves better outside of Manitouish. So I'm not hiring the ski bum or the person that goes to class and, and just does the classroom and parties a lot. I'm hiring somebody that's out in the community, um, bettering their leadership skills. They're working with people, they're working with kids, they're trying out their teaching styles. Um, that's what I'm looking for. And our leaders have really come around to that. And for instance, Sam here, um, he wanted to, to work at Manitowish this last summer. So he, he was very pointed in making sure that he was doing stuff um, outside of camp. And he actually flew to um, Africa and did some work with a school in Africa. And uh, that was one of the first things he talked about when, when I interviewed him this last year. And it's, it's amazing what our staff can do and we really push them to go out there and make a difference. That's all I have um, for this webinar. Like I said, there's six trips, so I kind of skimmed them over them. Um, I do want to point out one thing as far as gear goes. If you have questions on gear, you can definitely ask here in a minute. However, um, there are what to bring lists on the website, and I will put that in a link uh, with this recording that I'll send out to everybody. And make sure you check out that Check out those what to bring lists before signing up for one of these trips as some of them get kind of extensive, not so much at the intermediate or voyager level, but definitely down the road at the advanced and expo level. So I want to make sure that everybody's aware of the gear intensity that some of these trips um, encounter as, as their participants go through the program. But at this time, I'll stop the recording. If you have questions and you're watching this recording after the fact, please call me, please email me, and I'll answer those as best as possible. Um, other than that, have yourself a great night.